Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to our webinar today on the importance of corporate reorganization, turnaround, and insolvency in the economic recovery that we hope is going to follow on quickly from this uh, long drawn out pandemic. We couldn't have a better person to speak on this topic. David Buckler is chairman of leading insolvency and turnaround firm Buckler Phillips, and he is joined by consultant Mark Field, known to many of us as the long serving MP for the cities of London and Westminster. And germane to this talk, he was the founder of two businesses and a corporate lawyer. Briefly, to introduce myself, my name is Robert Pay. I'm a long standing associate of ZN, and it's my pleasure to be able to chair this event today. But I can only do this with thanks to the FS Club sponsors. Uh, it's our sponsors' generosity that allows us to range widely and freely across the fields of technology, economics, and finance. Let's have a look at the agenda. Well, my job is to get out of the way as quickly as possible and hand over to our speakers, but a few housekeeping notes. Firstly, the slides are available to download in the chat and on the website. And after the talk, we'll be holding a 20 minute Q&A session. So please make sure to use the GoToWebinar chat facility to send your questions in to me. I'll then feed them into the conversation. So without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, David and Mark. Robert, thank you very much and good day to everybody. Uh, I think we'd all be grateful for the opportunity at some point when the good housekeeping notes uh, say something a little bit about fire escapes and the like, but that uh, is something we'll have to look forward to uh, in the future. But there are no two economic recoveries are entirely identical. But before we become too carried away at the apparent uniqueness of the uh, post-pandemic landscape in a globalized economy, it's always wise, I think, to step back and apply the lessons of history and perspective. Now, I barely need to point out this afternoon that grasping an historical understanding and maintaining a keen interest uh, in the perspective economically comes entirely natural to the entire team here at ZN and Long Finance. Indeed, the provision of dispassionate, independent, evidence-driven advice lies, I think, at the heart of what my old uh, friend, Alderman Professor Michael Benelli's modus operandi. And uh, it's also lovely to see Robert back here in the UK, um, albeit in a virtual uh, process at the moment. Um, and I know that he will continue to work hard uh, in a lot that ZM continues to do. Um, the team, I think, have always offered thought-provoking sense of perspective in the aftermath of the last financial crisis. And I certainly felt the benefit of that uh, as the local member of parliament in trying to put forward some of the concerns uh, at, uh, at parliamentary debates. But amidst the slew of press speculation in the turnaround and restructuring arena, uh, I shall attempt along with David today uh, to carve out some of the trees from the woods. Indeed, here are only a few of the headlines from breathless news items from the Financial Times, the Telegraph and the Times in recent weeks. Business failure fears rise as furlough help eases. Tenants brace for clashes with owners as the cliff edge looms. When the bankruptcies begin, it will show normality is returning. Big four firms re uh, uh, sell restructuring units to focus on audit work. Landlords gripe at CBAs. And money men who always win when retail is in crisis. Now, from half a lifetime in politics and a fair few years, either running or in senior non-executive positions in the world of commerce, uh, one eternal truth is that no challenge or problem is entirely novel. So in charting a path for businesses, large or small, out of these torrid times into making the most of the economic recovery that is, I think, already upon us, it is, I think, worth exploring the roads best taken and some of those perhaps best advised to be avoided in past downturns. At Bookler Phillips, we have a reputation for working in close quarters alongside businesses in temporary difficulties, steadying the ship and finding innovative ways 
of ensuring that they are able to fight another day. This requires empathy, experience, and access to expertise with the widest range of industry backgrounds and connections. Above all, it is offering a bespoke, confidential service without any preconceptions uh, or a desire for the facts to fit into a ready-made set of solutions and templates. Bookla Phillips is the UK's leading independent corporate recovery, turnaround and restructure firm. Based on a professional heritage dating back to the 1930s, the senior team at Bookla Phillips is equally comfortable advising global corporations, small and medium enterprises or individuals on all aspects of financial and operational challenges as well as supporting them in their ambitions to grow. We're backed by partners and team members with decades of experience bringing to any given assignment a unique independent insight free from conflicts of interest that is often sought but rarely found by clients or co-advisors. The insolvency profession has changed enormously over the last 25 years. The introduction of administration and company voluntary arrangement has now been supplemented by the new 26A restructure process which was introduced by the government last summer and follows a similar cram down adopted in the USA under their chapter 11 procedures. This type of legislation is designed to help companies in financial difficulties and offers the right options and solutions where possible for the best results. But the major philosophy underlying Bookler Phillips, is work out, not bailout. In a business climate battered by a global pandemic, turnaround and restructuring are the most important areas of focus. The turnaround profession has grown in importance during the, this period, with most aspects of turnaround work falling into two key areas financial restructuring and operational restructuring. Financial restructuring is the reorganization of a business's assets and liabilities to reach an appropriate and sustainable balance and can explore uh, some of the following or all of the following options. Debt for equity swaps or recapitalization, capital raising with venture capital strategic partners, managed exits or return of capital through solvent winding up process, schemes of arrangements or company voluntary arrangements, and moratorium, uh, particularly under the section 26A procedures that I mentioned. Operational restructuring and turnaround requires a root and branch review of the business functions and how they generate revenue, exploring these options, improving and refining business models whilst supporting management to execute, developing flexible routes to margin improvement, optimizing efficiency and cash flow, managing stakeholder expectations and ensuring timely delivery of a restructure plan, dealing with director or shareholder disputes. In doing all of this, it's important to adopt the culture of the company and establish trust and credibility with management and the general workforce. Once trust and confidence has been achieved, it's important to identify the underlying problem, the strength 
of the core businesses and the ultimate goal. This could involve a broad overview of contemporary financial options uh, and financing options in ascertaining the most efficient and cost-effective financial and financing structure. These might include special purpose vehicles, equity issues, private placements and angel funding, loan note issues, invoicing finance, commercial mortgages, asset finance, finance leasing, asset-based lending, operating leases, and venture capital. Now, before I go on to uh, case studies, um, there might be a poll. Robert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, in true Financial Services Club uh, format, we have a poll today. So, please select one of these uh, sectors, select the one that you believe will be the quickest coming out of the recession. So, which of the following areas of the economy will recover the quickest? And can you select now, please? People coming in quite quickly there. So, interesting. Mark, do you have any comments on uh, what the audience has uh, come back with here? Well, I think um, we've come together sadly, inadvertently on what is um, quite a momentous day, and I think all of us will have an eagle eye and ear open to what uh, the uh, Prime Minister has to say at six o'clock today. I think uh, it's been widely predicted we're going to see an extension. Uh, in, in the period um, of, um, or, or at least we're not, going to go, not going to move to the next stage of, of opening up. And I think um, uh, in the circumstances uh, that is understandable. Um, it is also clear that furlough arrangements are going to be wound down to a certain extent. Uh, and I think the focus therefore on furlough money in the next few months will be on those businesses that are regarded as viable and sustainable. I think what's interesting about this poll um, is that one might have thought that it would be um, a good deal more um, pessimism on the hos uh, hospitality side and put hospitality and retail together. Now, the fact is um, that, uh, and certainly I've seen it uh, as a central London resident, uh, the ingenuity of quite a lot of hospitality um, owners has been, I think, quite an eye opener uh, in recent months. So obviously, dare I say, the, the super weather we've had in the last four or five weeks has meant uh, that uh, things have recovered more quickly. Uh, I'm certainly very struck, though, by this poll that. Uh, in areas such as professional services, technology, uh, and to a slightly less extent, construction, that there seems to be um, a fair bit of optimism going forward. As I say, I think the economy is already in recovery mode. Uh, one of the issues faced, I think, by uh, certainly by um, construction hospitality will be the issue of, of labor and labor costs going up, um, not least uh, because uh, the sort of seasonal uh, labor that has been relied upon in those sorts of industries in recent years isn't going to be uh, available quite so easily. So I think it's a fascinating poll, it really is. Um, and uh, I think in many ways it reflects both some of the uh, optimism broadly for the economy, but also I think recognizes that there are going to be challenges ahead um, as the furlough plays itself out. Um, I think uh, if we may, if we can move on to some uh, specific case studies, which I hope will be of interest uh, to those on the webinar, if I can pass back to David. Thank you, Mark. Um, three case studies for you. Um, just to give you a, a feel in different cases of the sort of turnaround opportunities that there are, and then some of the issues that are being faced in different areas. Um, the first case study was one called Baltimore Technologies, which was a, a leading Irish internet security company listed on the stock exchange 
and NASDAQ and briefly part of the FTSE 100 index. Uh, buoyed by the appeal of its digital certificate business, which was seen as a vital tool to enable e-commerce, the company rocketed to a market value at one stage of 13 billion US dollars before seeing its shares collapse alongside other tech stock in the dot-com bubble. Now the challenge, after three years of disposals, the board announced its intention to move into the clean energy business with a high profile team of leading directors. The plan was abandoned uh, uh, very soon after when the investor acquisitor holdings of Bermuda acquired sufficient shares to take control of the, of the cash and invited me to step in as chairman to crystallize Baltimore's remaining value. Um, 24 million pounds in cash, its listed status, and more than a billion pounds in accumulated tax losses. On the minor side, there were several significant liabilities, including 100,000 square feet of office property uh, in a portfolio that was sublet at below cost rates, and a potential four and a half million pound lawsuit from a disgruntled former joint venture partner, uh, Earthport. Solution. Um, I and my team quickly reviewed the need for a share listing as part of far reaching measures to reduce costs. At the same time, terminating Baltimore's American Depository Receipt Program would remove the company, would remove the company's need to file reports with the Security and Exchange Commission and higher US counsel. Deals were negotiated on leases and with other creditors, while tax assets arising from losses were maximized. Uh, Baltimore was delisted from the London Stock Exchange, and once the assets and liabilities of the company had been finalized, the board uh, relisted and the restructured cash shell on AIM at 15p a share, announcing a strategy to become a specialist financial services business. Within six months, the company was acquired by Oryx International Growth Fund for 23p a share. The second case study was one called Langbar International. Langbar was a company listed on the AIM market of the London Stock Exchange as Crown Corporation in 2003 and represented the largest share fraud on AIM to date. It was investigated by the Serious Fraud Office, the City of London Police, the, account the Accountancy uh, Investigations and Disciplinary Bodies, and was subject of many civil and legal actions in the High Court. Crown Corporation, which changed its name to Langbar International Limited in 2005, was an old fashioned pump and dump fraud in that the company did not possess the assets it declared at listing. The business's original purpose was purportedly buying underperforming companies and improving them before selling them at a profit. Some 59% of the shares in the company were purchased by Lambert Financial Investments 
for a total of $570 million, with $275 million presented as a certificate of deposit from the Banco of Brazil, and $295 million uh, as a deferred payment. Langbar was notified that the certificate of deposit was fraudulent and the deferred funds were never paid. Other related party stockholders also failed to pay for their shares. Despite being aware of the serious financial shortcomings, Langbar misled investors <coughs> as to the state of its finances, including making increasingly extravagant claims about its investment activities. In June 2005, Stuart Pearson, managing director of Langbar Capital, traveled to Brazil to be presented with an elaborate deception aimed at convincing him that the company's financial value was legitimate. Crown merged with Pearson's investment firm taking its name Langbar International. The value of Langbar rose with Pearson's declarations to the market that the funds had been released from Brazil, which encouraged further investment. However, trading was suspended in October 2005 when the company's value was questioned, just days after the executive chairman, Marius Ryback, had resigned and had made 2.5 million pounds from one of his share sales, followed rapidly by the company's collapse. Investors, most of whom purchased shares after Pearson came on board, lost as much as 100 million pounds. <clears throat> as part of the solution, in the turnaround and investigation of Langbar, I was appointed as independent chairman by shareholders later in the same month. I brought in a team led by Larry Jobs to establish the scale of the fraud, suspected to be somewhere in the region of 365 million pounds. They were unable to establish the existence of or verify the company's entitlement to any of the funds at any time in the company's history. <clears throat> I ascertained that the company under previous management had failed to make the appropriate disclosures, particularly during the period in which it was in takeover talks. Working with legal advisors Jones Day and the SFO, my team obtained a word worldwide Mareva injunction and after litigating and chasing money through Europe, tracked down former directors and executives, leading to seven arrests in Switzerland and Spain, including Rybacks. <clears throat> the outcome. The team found and froze more than 35 million pounds. A distribution was made through a scheme of arrangement to shareholders. In 2007, Nabarro Wells, a London stockbroker that had advised Langbar, was fined £250,000 for due diligence uh, failures. The litigation against Ryback was successful and money was recovered. Pearson was charged with 13 counts of fraud, faced trial to determine how much he knew of the fraud when he had discovered it. He was found guilty in 2011 and jailed on three counts for making dis misleading, false or deceptive or reckless claims about the existence of the money. It was a blatant fraud and contributed to the rewriting of company requirements on AIM. 
The third case is a company called London Asia Capital, uh, listed on the AIM market of the London Stock Exchange, principally an investment group focusing on China and other Asian markets. The challenge was that since its IPO and various fundraisings, totaling approximately 100 million, LAC had built a labyrinth structure of investments and acquisitions which were incomprehensible to all but those who had transacted them. Former directors and senior executives appeared to have enriched themselves at the expense of shareholders who saw no return on the substantial amount committed to deals over several years. <clears throat> These shareholders had appointed previous independent chairman and directors to realize long hidden value, but the opacity of the group's portfolio combined with the disagreement amongst board members had made progress very slow. And the solution, I was appointed as independent chairman by shareholders in 2011. I brought a team led by Paul Bobroff as managing director to review realizable assets and engage with the group's main Chinese trading partner and Singapore-based largest shareholder. The team traveled regularly to China, uh, to China to discuss strategic opportunities. Meanwhile, unraveling the web of investments with remaining value, cutting costs and litigating selectively where it was in the interest of shareholder value. In the outcome, the team recovered 15 million of funds, not only from Asia, but worldwide. The distribution was made to shareholders with an offer to buy back their shares and this was widely accepted. The company is left with one principal asset, a 20% holding in a Chinese clean energy company based in Wuhan. That business is undergoing its own restructure, which is unsurprising, uh, uh, which is unsurprisingly slow by being at the epicenter of the COVID-19 outbreak, but the restructure continues steadily uh, and there is more to come from that undoubtedly in the future. Thanks David. <clears throat> You'll gather, let's see, the sheer variety of uh, restructuring and turnaround that uh, is exciting. And I should perhaps stress as well as the AIM and public companies referred to here, uh, we also uh, do a lot of work uh, for smaller um, uh, entities uh, of uh, turnover around about five million uh, pounds. Uh, a lot of it is, has an overseas element, but uh, other parts, of course, that uh, are very substantial here within the UK market. Um, and we've often been able to assist many domestic businesses as they work uh, in overseas areas. So thank you for listening to us. I know that we're going to move on to a Q&A session, and I'm happy to pass back to Robert Payne. Well, thank you very much, David and Mark, for that. And yes, I have some questions here for you related to the, the case studies that we've heard. Um, the first one's a, a, a general point, which is sort of COVID related, it comes from Bob McDowell. Will the well-documented backlog of court cases inhibit the approval process for corporate restructurings, or will these processes be streamlined by court administrators? Do you have any um, views on that? <laughs> well, I'm going I'm, 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 I'm to ask did David go to think of some insolvency advice. Um, no. Listen, I know the frustration um, with, with the court backlogs in, the, in this country. All I would say is, uh, as a former foreign Commonwealth Office Minister for Asia, uh, of course, you go to someone like India and you have a backlog that literally goes uh, runs back into, into decades to, to a certain extent. But no, I mean, it is a serious point that is, that is being made and given the viability of companies, uh, there will be a, a sense of urgency, which I, I understand. David, have you any thoughts on it? Yeah, it's, it, it is amazing how in one year, 
the courts have gone from uh, their wonderful structures and courtrooms and uh, processes to um, uh, having full trials and full hearings uh, by Zoom. So um, uh, now the court process is all online. Um, there are no cases that need to just stop because you're not online. And it is amazing how that process has, has moved everything forward from perhaps a rather antiquated way of working to a much more modern way of working. So hopefully, uh, although the delays uh, I know are huge in some cases, in some areas, uh, hopefully it's going to be um, the new technology will enable the courts to catch up quite quickly. Would it be right in thinking that uh, sort of if, if, if uh, these processes don't move fast enough, that's actually going to uh, mean that fewer companies emerge out of um, a sort of a reorganization phase? I think there's a danger of that, uh, and uh, there's that famous uh, maxim, justice delayed is justice denied, and I think it is very important, particularly um, given the uh, question marks about viability and sustainability of, uh, of businesses in the crisis, that, uh, that we are able to move uh, as, as swiftly as we can. Okay. There's, I have two questions that are essentially on the sort of human capital aspects of, uh, of reorganizations. Um, in the Baltimore Technologies case, you talked about the need to um, fit in with the, with the organization's culture. And Paul Kitchener asked the question, you know, do you get involved at all with modifying existing culture? Is that part of uh, your remit? And then uh, related to that is when you're doing a preliminary assessment for the operational restructuring, do you also perform an assessment of where the company is in terms of its human capital management. And that question comes from uh, Revis Hills Ward. So the, the answer actually is, is yes to both. We, we have uh, H, as part of our team, we have HR consultants um, and they will work with us uh, in, in the assessment of uh, the people and the workforce and the culture uh, and um, uh, that culture is very important because we sometimes go into uh, businesses and uh, we find that businesses are uh, perhaps more run by fear uh, than, than anything else and, and uh, you can have uh, that fear culture as something which becomes uh, prevalent throughout the whole of the, the organization. Um, and people are just not prepared to put their head above the parapet and, uh, you know, they, they, they just don't, you know, they, they know they're going to be bitten if they do. Uh, and, and then we come along and we, we produce a, a totally different culture because our culture is very inclusive, um, um, very together, uh, and the leadership is very inclusive. And, and it, 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 it's funny, you can have, um, you know, there are two types of leadership. There is autocratic leadership, which is in a silo, and then there is inclusive leadership, um, which, which uh, becomes more like a tri triangle, the more, the more you have inclusive leadership, the more you're able to uh, have leadership going down the whole organization. And people then take a responsibility, take ownership of what they're doing. And that, that to me, is a much better uh, form of leadership than, than uh, leadership in a silo. And that's how we try to work within organizations. And that does often bring out a lot of fascinating uh, information and news and, and usually a much better way of working forward. So, yeah, that's quite interesting. 
that, thank you. The whole of the question. That's, that, that's great. Can I um, can I ask you put to you one more question from uh, from Douglas Andrews? What are the differences in the types of corporate crisis um, between the, the the financial crisis of two thousand and eight nine and the COVID pandemic? Do you see any any differences in the likely fallout? Um, uh, uh, they are very different. Um, the the corporate crisis uh, of 2009 was very much financially led, um, where you had uh, uh, banks collapsing, financial institutions collapsing, um, Lehman's being the largest one of the of, of the group that uh, collapsed at the time. Um, and uh, uh, all of the consequences that, that fell on from there. I think the one thing the one would, would obviously say um, that the there was a liquidity crisis uh, yeah. that, that came about uh, during 2007 and 2008, the so-called credit crunch. And the one thing, um, perhaps understandably, um, that, that, that uh, governments have uh, ensured that there's, there's plenty of liquidity through quantitative easing. Uh, I think, uh, as you all know, and uh, I know it's close to the heart of many at ZN. There is a sense in which uh, we have now got uh, a huge amount of liquidity in, in the system in a potentially very dangerous way with quantitative easing. We, we've had emergency interest rates in this country now since March of 2009. Um, and I am reminded of um, uh, re reading as I was last uh, Christmas, the uh, um, biography of uh, Margaret Thatcher mm -hmm. by, by Charles Moore. And he said, that during the whole of Margaret Thatcher's time in Downing Street from 79 to 1990, um, there was a brief window um, during the Lawson boom when interest rates were as low as 7.5%. Yes. Um, <laughs> we've now had a situation since March of 2009, uh, li li literally um, for over 12 years, you know, 124, 125 months uh, of emergency interest rates when they've never been higher than 0.75%. In, in this country. And uh, one can't help thinking there are consequences, not least the mispricing of risk that will work its way through the system. But I think the fundamental difference, as I say, is that uh, whereas there was a, uh, a liquidity crisis that led then to uh, an insolvency related crisis with certain players back in 2008 09, that hasn't happened yet. But it does mean probably there are a lot of zombie companies that are still continuing and there's been very little incentive for the banks to foreclose. That, of course, may change before too long as well. Right. Thanks for that. Um, a, a second question from Bob, Bob McDowell. Uh, in the slipstream of recovery from COVID, should we anticipate many protracted restructurings arising from fraud and misappropriation as the uh, result of the furlough and bank loan defaults? Yeah, I, I mean, actually, I think we're already beginning to see it. Um, that there are uh, there, there are uh, already uh, situations which have arisen where um, loans have been taken, where money has been used inappropriately, um, where the direct you know directors' minis have been converted into Ferraris. Um, for all sorts of, um, yeah. I'm sure, good reasons, um, and uh, you know, uh, and I think that will be a, a feature. And it is not surprising that in times of trouble, uh, there is a higher propensity of uh, fraudulent activity, and this is something that that might find its way out in the next year or two uh, as, as things are looked at in greater detail. Yeah, my, my instinct, I guess, uh, Bob, would be that uh, I think there will be a desire from uh, the Treasury particularly to cleanse the system quickly. Um, uh, yes, uh, huge amounts of public money have been uh, thrown at this and inevitably, inevitably, some of that is going to be uh, used nefariously or, or in, in, in an advised way. What I suspect will happen in terms of um, protracted litigation, there will be one or two high-profile 
cases, perhaps designed to encourage others yeah, for future downturns. Okay. Um, so a general question come in that um, basically how is it that sort of uh, restructuring advisors such as uh, Buckler Phillips can actually help um, to help a company? What is it, what is it that, that companies who are sort of um, a little bit wobbly could be doing right now? Um, uh, I think um, any company that is, is wobbling should immediately seek advice. Uh, it doesn't have to cost anything. We do, we do our initial advice with people free of charge. So you can sit down, you can have um, a, a really in-depth discussion uh, and, and a working meeting on trying to work a way forward uh, without it costing you anything, but it could give you a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts. It could be very thought-provoking. Um, so to give a sort of menu of options as of that, and I think all too often when the crisis hits, and you know, I have a lot of sympathy for people, particularly in the sort of businesses in the hospitality um, type area, who you know literally not be able to do business, but they may feel their options are very limited. And actually, I think one of the benefits of what we do on the restructuring uh, advisory side is to, for people to recognise that, that those options may be rather broader than they had had initially thought. Yeah. Okay, well, I think uh, unless there are any more questions coming in, I think it really falls to me now to thank uh, you both very much for your presentation and uh, to have a little look and see what is uh, coming up next in the series of webinars. And um, there are actually three happening this week. Uh, Michael Merle is going to be talking to a mathematical physicist tomorrow, so I'm glad that it's him that's actually chairing that and not me uh, with a relatively poor O-level maths to my name. Uh, on Wednesday, we have the launch of the Smart Centers Index number three, which is part of the ZN series of financial um, centers uh, indices that have been running for a long time and which are much reported in the media. And then, you know, germane to um, some of the geopolitical discussions that have been going on, a look at cooperation between European and Chinese capital markets. Um, so, with, um, unfortunately, we can't hear you, we can't hear the audience applause, but I think you can take that for, for granted. Michael didn't lend me his uh, Korean karmic clapper to, uh, to gong you off. So you'll just have to make do with me thanking you very much indeed and uh, assuming the audience is doing the same. And as I click, I'll be saying goodbye to you and uh, see you all here sometime soon. Thank you, David. Thank you, Mark. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.